Very good. So welcome, everyone. Tonight, I'll be presenting the second part of a Love with Limits series. Two weeks ago, in another video on the YouTube channel, uh, Mike Fogel's Art of Friendship, I presented part one, which is all about creating the ideal environment to help children, uh, to motivate children to practice and repeat social skills until they become habit. So really a very positive cycle that encourages acquisition of new behaviors. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on the second half, which is um, helping kids to maybe uh, give up or fade out unhelpful behaviors uh, or unwanted behaviors or disruptive behaviors. So we're going to talk about behavior modification strategies, reward systems, and also use of consequences in a very strategic way. Uh, and so my hope is that you'll be able to take at least one thing from this presentation home with you or to your work, and uh, you can employ that. If you get more than one thing out of it, that's even better, that's a bonus. But so listen throughout to see if there's one thing that really resonates with a child or children that you support. We are going to do question and answers at the end. So if you wouldn't mind, just please remaining muted. And uh, we will have time to answer all your questions. You can chat them and you can also unmute yourself at the end to ask. And this book is the third in a series of biweekly presentations supporting the national release of my book. And the content from tonight and the other, the part one, are excerpts from the book. And so if you want to learn more or have a hard copy of it, you can find it there. And it's on our, my social skills website, the Art of Friendship socialskills.com. Okay. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, the ARCH program. This is an approach that ARCH is what I talk about in the book. And it's a program that wraps around a child's whole functioning. And it supports all children who struggle, but especially kids with social, emotional, cognitive challenges. So I coined this term, SECCs, and this term uh, speaks to sort of the umbrella category of kids who have neurodevelopmental differences. You might call them neurodiverse. They're kids who process differently. And so it could be autism, the mild presentation, used to be called Asperger syndrome, uh, ADHD, learning differences. And they also often have simultaneous anxiety and self-regulation challenges, all of which uh, the book uh, speaks to and this presentation does as well. And so tonight I wanna to talk about behavior. And one sort of playful way that we talk about it is uh, in terms of the iceberg theory, okay? And so if you see, let's pretend that this is you, uh, you're on this boat, um, the SS caregiver, and there you have your, your telescope, you're looking ahead and you can see poking out from the ocean, from the sea, an iceberg, the very top, the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is the visible part, which is what kids' behaviors are. Things that they say and things that they do, that's the tip of the iceberg, that's the visible aspect of their experience. But beneath that, every good sailor and captain knows that there's a lot more ice beneath the water. In fact, it's usually bigger than the amount that's showing. So what are all the things that are beneath kids' behavior? You know, we have feelings, thoughts, there are tensions inside, sensory experience, memories, all these things are under there and they're seeking release and it comes out in behavior. And some behaviors uh, are really helpful. Positive coping, positive social behaviors, making great choices. We want the kids to do more of that. And so above the surface right here, you see um, start behaviors, right? So start behaviors, we're gonna talk about those. Those are behaviors you wanna see the kids do more of. And then the other half are the stop behaviors right above my head here. And stop behaviors are those things that you want the kids to your, the child in question to do less of or to stop doing. Now, an interesting thing, if you use strategies for stop behaviors, you will defeat the purpose of your of start behaviors. So here's an increased behavior. Behaviors we wanna see the child, your child increase. And to get to increase behaviors that you desire, you need to have positive reinforcement also known as rewards. You can't reward negative behaviors because kids are gonna do more of that, right? Conversely, 
decreased behaviors are those behaviors you want to see the child do less of. And so these require clear expectations and limits and predictable and consistent consequences. And if you act rewarding in these situations, then unwittingly you will um, encourage your child to repeat and repeat uh, negative behaviors that really aren't helpful. So we have to be very strategic about what approach we're using for what behavior. And that's really what we're gonna talk about tonight. And here's a, a more creative way of showing it. It's love and limits. So love is the warmth side, the reward side in my mind. And then I imagine limits, you know, that cloud, there are drops, but they almost look like teardrops. And so having uh, just the right measure of love and limits is what a child needs to grow. So here's a child as a plant growing out of the ground. And um, so each child needs a slightly different measure of love and limits. So no two children are alike, whether they're neurotypical or neuro neurodiverse. So we have to get to know the child. So let's get into the ARCH method of social coping training. Okay, this is what we use in my day camp at, the camp at Camp Pegasus. We also use it in our social skills program, The Art of Friendship. We teach it to schools. We teach it to parents so that we can wrap our arms around a child's whole world and create a holistic um, social training approach. So here's the, the arch, all right? So the A in the arch is anticipating and teaching. We have to teach social skills and anticipate what they need and provide structure. So we wanna provide structure and give skill building. That's under anticipate. That's the proactive stuff that we can do. Then your child enter, enters the world and the world is your child's social skills group. And so the R and the C are what you do when your child is just living life. We wanna reinforce and reward all the positives that your child puts out. And so that's the, those, that's reinforcing the, the increased behaviors, those behaviors you wanna see your child do more. The C is compassionate social coaching for social mess ups mm -hmm. and, and mistakes. And then we're gonna talk about the H tonight, which is a holding environment. A holding environment is a psychological term for limits and boundaries that create a container that holds a child and decreases anxiety and helps them to feel more in control. So we're going to talk about that in the second part of tonight. So we did a deep dive into the A to anticipate in the part one of this, of this presentation, which you can find online on the YouTube channel, uh, Mike Fogel's Art of Friendship. Uh, but we're going to touch on it tonight because we still need to build on it. So anticipate. So we need to teach social awareness. We need to teach emotional coping skills. And then we need to proactively plan for your child's participation participation in their various activities of life. And this is a sample of a social skill we teach frequently. It's one of the core of all of social functioning. And it's if then, it's social cause and effect. And so it's the action reaction of life. If I act blank, then kids will do blank. If I act blank, then kids will think certain things about me. They'll feel certain things about me and they'll do something. This also relates to behavior and consequences. If I act effectively and engage in a positive uh, social or positive choices, positive behaviors, then I'll most likely have positive outcomes and positive reinforcement. But if I act inappropriately or disruptively, then I will get a consequence. And teaching this explicitly and helping kids to understand the social, the social cause and effect of their behavior is critical for your child to be able to start making positive and healthy decisions about what behaviors they're going to try. I didn't share this last time in the other video, and this is a core skill also, which is self-determination. And many of the kids who come to us for therapy or in our programs, by the time they arrive in our doors, they, are, they feel as though the world happens to them. Like, oh, they were mean to me. They made me laugh, right? So they point the finger out at other people, but they don't realize that they could have made a choice. They had more power than they ever realized. And so that's our message. So in this picture, here's this blue person walking on the road of her life. She's walking along and then right there you can see the road splits at that orange dot. And 
serving any number of children that I work with, they would all prefer to take that upper road. We call it the road to happiness, but also academically, it could be the road to success, the road to uh, contentment. Uh, the other road, the road down below is the road to sadness or anger, the road to failure or struggle. So depending on your child, you can select what, what language you want, you want to call each of those stops. So your child reaches where the road splits and we call that decision point. And you have to ask yourself, well, what might happen if I do X, Y, or Z? Will it be my road to happiness? Will it be my road to unhappiness? Will I succeed or will I create more struggle? So we tell this to kids and we help them to see that they have dozens of choices each day, possibly over a hundred. Some choices are small. Do I want chocolate or vanilla? Some choices are large, like, oh, I'm so mad. I could just, my fist is balled up and I could let it fly. I could hit that friend of mine, but I'm gonna to decide to walk away and take a break. That's a powerful decision. That's a big decision. So are you going to choose to cope or are you going to choose to, to be impulsive? Now, this is hard for the impulsive person, but nevertheless, we have to enter it into their awareness and have them start to select uh, and, and think about this, okay? Mm -hmm. I can make things better or I can make them worse. I have the power to direct my life in positive ways. And everything that we talk about tonight is going to help children really become clear about that. Next, also, we're still in the A of the ARCH. In an A, anticipating, write positive rules about what you wanna see the kid, your child do. So these positive expectations for increased behaviors include um, just everyday coping behaviors, how they treat other people or siblings. It also could be the, uh, them using their learned coping skills. So do follow directions the first time you're asked. Do use your calming strategies. Do use kind words and voices. And then after a while, you can take off the word do and have it be a regular sentence with regular English. Include others in your, in your uh, conversations. Ask conversation questions and volley the conversation back and forth. So whatever your child is working on, you want to make a do rule. And I wouldn't make more than three for preschoolers and not more than five for elementary school kids. And this is still as appropriate for people in middle school or high school. Just don't make it cute. Um, but you are expected to get your homework done every night, right? So you can do that. And um, so now you've created these do rules and you can include rules like um, put great behaviors in the golden line from that first poster I shared. Do take the road to happiness. Make great choices, make positive choices. So coping skills can also go into this list. No more than three to five, depending on your child's age. Here's a sample. This is what we use at our camp. You know, do follow directions. Grownups must be in charge. Do keep your hands and feet to yourself, even if you're mad, right? So that's a sample of WPP, writing, publishing, and posting. So we wanna make sure that uh, for the child who has social challenges, our words can become invisible and immaterial. So when you write it down, it becomes concrete and permanent. So write it down, show it to the child, publish it, and then post it, put it up on a fridge, put it up in your child's bedroom uh, so that they can remember it and you can review it. We always do that with our camp rules. Every morning, there's a ritual reading of the rules. So that's anticipating, we're teaching the skills, we're creating these expectations with the do, do rules, okay? Now, your child is moving out into the world and your child is practicing social skills wherever he or she goes, okay? And so now we want to reinforce, we want to create positive cycles that are motivating. It will motivate your child to try to repeat these because A, we're asking your child to do something that's hard. B, we're asking your child possibly to change their habits, and it's hard to change a habit if they're used to acting a certain way in a social situation. So we really need to create these positive cycles and to undo some of the negative cycles that your child might be in. If we think about, you know, a lot of the corrections and negative attention that kids can get out at school, you know, get back in your seat, back in your seat, cut that out, stop, stop bothering her, stop bothering her. So there's a lot of correction that way, a lot of redirection. And from peers, you know, stop, stop. Leave me alone, stop annoying me. So they might be hearing some of these kind of messages also. So the world can be demotivating and encourage your child to either withdraw or 
give up, have learned helplessness. So we want to create really positive cycles. So we're going to turn some of these negative cycles positive. And so what we do is we observe little micro behaviors, decisions your child makes. You know, if they're working on something like school, perseverance, effort. And when you see it, you say it. When you see what they're doing, then you give words to it. So you're going to reflect what you say, what you see. And then we use targeted ignoring for negative behaviors. Now, targeted ignoring doesn't mean you're ignoring your child. So let's be clear. You're not ignoring the person. You might ignore a behavior. And we'll talk more about that later. But the short description of it is when you're, if you're ignoring uh, your, your thought processes, is this hurting anyone, this behavior? And is it function? Is it non-functional? Is it stopping our group or family from doing what we need to do? If it's neither disruptive and it's not hurting anyone, ignore for now. Pick your battles and save your comments for things that really are impactful, okay? So that's one way that we can attend to the positive is just to decrease some of the negative comments that we, that we are just prone to catching, all right? So to create positive cycles, we have targeted positive reflection, TPR. And we take a snapshot of your child's success. So TPR is like this photo where we have this person uh, having the subject of their, of their photo is in the viewfinder and they go, psh, they snap a picture. So kids who I work with, kids who are neurodiverse, they might bop around through their day without really discriminating which were the better behaviors that they executed and which were the ones that didn't work out better because they have a hard time reading social cues. They're not getting that clear feedback. They might be missing that. So when an adult caregiver stops for a second and gives them credit for what they just did, they've just now taken a snapshot of that behavior. And so see it. And that's why we say it. Let them know. Oh, so you can comment on, give this targeted positive reflection, reflect their behavior for social behavior, how they're getting along with others, how they're coping, how their coping efforts are working. You calm down. You took a break. That was great. You calmed down in like three minutes today. That was really fast. Work habits, things that they can control and decisions and choices. Do not give TPR um, in very general terms, like you're so cute or you're so smart because kids can't, don't have control over that. They can't control cute. They can't control smart. Those are kind of abstract and they're traits, uh, but they're not behaviors. So make sure that it's something that you can see your child do or hear your child say. So we give this TPR and the language of TPR is you, you, you. And it's like, uh, there's a TV commercial on the East Coast and it's called, it's by Rafferty Subaru and it goes, it's all about you, you, you at Rafferty Subaru. Da, na, na, na. And so um, social training and the positive cycles is all about you, you, you to your child with this TPR. And so you can track all the decisions that your child makes which means that you're catching their self-determination. But you decided to do this. You changed your mind about that. You were so flexible. So decisions, when you reflect them, you're reflecting and taking a snapshot of this moment where your child mentally decided to do something. That was powerful. You can get control over that and you can decide to make positive choices. You can track any problem solved. You did it. You figured that out, out all by yourself. And you can also track conflict resolution with two kids. You two, you worked it out. That was great. You two got back to fun. Incredible job. We're proud of you. Well done, right? So let kids know which behaviors among all the behaviors that they did all day were the effective ones. You can also give TPR for any rules that they followed. If one of your rules is follow directions, great job following directions. You know, great cooperation. Um, it, keep your hands and feet to yourself, even if you are mad. You can say like, wow, you kept your hands and feet together. That's great. Clap, we're cheerleaders. Yes, we want to see more of that. That was really helpful. Okay. So it can be for your do rules and it can be for just a myriad of behaviors throughout the day. Now, this is the new part for this presentation. I want to talk about those times where your child is working on a behavior 
And this behavior is a little sticky. Your child's having a hard time giving up this behavior or practicing a new behavior that you've been teaching. So your TPR, your positive reflection, may not be enough uh, to motivate your child to repeat and try this behavior. Maybe your child's just having a hard time getting out of their old habits or they're anxious about trying something new. So now what we wanna do is uh, we wanna add a sloppy, relationship-based, carnival-style reward system. This is what we use at our camp. This is what, uh, when I'm consulting with schools or, or families, this is the type of thing that we uh, develop. And this is the antidote to the old, stale, and ineffective um, just sticker chart, okay? So we wanna move beyond the sticker chart uh, for one key reason, above all else, oh, one small reason is that after a while, people seem to forget about it and they sort of just tail off and, and they, they seem to fade. But even more importantly, um, star systems or sticker charts often wind up being um, sort of almost play like gotcha games. And they catch, they are just as good at catching kids messing up as they are about rewarding. So an example is, let's say you uh, have a, a sticker chart going for a child at home. And it was like, okay, take a break if you're mad and uh, use your words to let people know what you need. Okay, so there's two main things on it. And so let's say your child's home after school from 3.30 until 8.30 when it's bedtime. And from 3.30 until 8.20, your child was golden. Followed the rules, they would get two stickers. But then, you know, right at 8.20, 10 minutes before bedtime, the night's over, they act up, they violate one of their rules, and all of a sudden, oh no, I'm so sorry. You don't get your prize. You don't get your sticker for the day. So now you're giving no messages. You're giving failure messages. And your child's not getting credit for the other, you know, four hours and whatever minutes that they were really on task. So it's not rewarding the actual behavior. And then you're having this frustrating uh, game catching them. So that's why I feel like um, we need to have more of a real-time feedback system. And that's what we developed in our programs. And so um, we just worked on, talked about TPR. So in real time, you're catching and reflecting the child's behavior, okay? And then what you're going to do is you add a token. In our programs, we use these paper clips. These paper clips, we call them chips. They become chips in our program and um, they're all worth one and then kids can add them up for prizes. Now, what I wanna share with you is a program that can be imported to a home or a school or other places. And so we call it the Bucks system, but it could be any kind. It could be marbles in a jar. It could be um, any kind of token, really. It could be popsicle sticks, colorful popsicle sticks. Um, but I'm gonna show you the, the buck system. We're gonna make funny money and it's real time concrete reinforcement of a behavior. For teens, you could have a different type of system that's more like credits and you could have check marks, and, but they're always getting positive. So um, we're creating external motivation. Now, not just the TPR that frames the moment, but outside the child, there's something else that's going to help to motivate them to think just a little harder about the next behavior. It de develops a little more self-awareness as your child thinks, ooh, like, you know, I want to do this, right? And so it tends to elicit more and more positive replacement coping skills. And as I mentioned, it builds self-awareness. They think just a little harder about what they're doing. And the reason it's sloppy is because uh, we know um, behaviorism tells us that the most effective reward systems are actually like variable. They're not the same. It's not like one, one uh, reward for each thing. So it varies. It could be a lot, it could be little. You might miss one because you're human and that's perfect. So here's how you make the buck system. You can create some funny money. If you just take a piece of copy paper, you can fold it in half three times. So you wind up with, what you see uh, behind me, which is um, eight bucks, eight of these rectangles. And in it, your child can decorate them. So if your child is artistic at all, or you could just get you know, actual funny money, monopoly money, or again, any other tokens. Okay, 
And so then your child will create them. And then you want to photocopy about 10 to 12 of these. Sometimes it's fun if you have access to colored paper, put it on some colorful paper as well. And now you have, when you cut it out, you'll have nearly a hundred of these bucks. Okay. Um, and then you're going to give one of these bucks or some amount of these bucks whenever you give TPR. So great eye contact, you know, you are so flexible, you know, bucks for you. Um, you used your words. That was so helpful. Bucks for you. So in real time, you're taking a snapshot of that behavior and now you're adding the token. Now you want to have some sort of a, a public container, a, a container in a public space where your child can have access to it. We want your child to get involved and get invested in counting the bucks. How many do I have? Because we're going to write three levels of prizes. There are going to be three levels here, okay? And so we're gonna have bucks, you cut them out. We're gonna create the, the prizes now, okay? So you give the bucks along with your TPR as it comes out of your mouth. Now, the reason it's also, so we mentioned sloppy, it's variable. Relationship-based is you can give bucks along with your enthusiasm for the moment. If your child does an everyday average kind of a thing, you know, um, something that's somewhat expected, certainly you can always, you know, give a buck here or there, you know, but if your child does that skill that's really hard that your child's been working on, you've been teaching in social skills, um, and your child finally does it, or your child who has um, self-regulation challenges, but then suddenly does the coping skill that helps him or her remain calm, you can use your enthusiasm and say, oh my gosh, you did it. Here, sloppy handful. Here's five bucks. Here's 10 bucks. So you can really be loose with it and sloppy. And that can show your child when they have that breakthrough moment, this was huge. Do more of that. And once your child produces a behavior once, that proves that they can do it. And now they can repeat it. Now they can be, begin repeating it. So just try to get your child to do the first the behavior one time, and then you can build out from there. Now, as far as creating prize options, this needs to be in the context of your family values. So we create you know, small, medium, and large prizes. And with these small these prizes, you know, if your family says, okay, screen time is okay, maybe there's a certain bonus time of screen time. If your family says, no, we don't, we don't believe in food as a reward. So no food prizes. If your fam family that says, believes, okay, we don't want to give uh, material things like toys or little plastic toys or a trip to the dollar store, then perhaps um, we do want to go on an, a family outing, maybe a special sleepover with a friend or a cousin. So three levels of prizes, as you can see here. And then it's really helpful for you to create the prize list with your child. So your child is now on alert. Wait a minute, these people want to give me prizes for what? You explain. And then you have to approve each level of prizes. You might uh, want to consider a dollar amount to help guide children. Okay, like, you know, the most, the highest amount for the large prizes, blah, blah, blah. You know, this amount for medium prize to help to guide also. So you don't have like, I want a new car. Um, so now you're working with your child and you have to approve the prize, okay? You have three levels of prizes. And so for little kids like preschool, you know, young elementary, first, second grade, initially prizes could be 10, 20, and 30. And because you want to hook them, you want them to have some success and realize, oh, this is fun. And then once your child gets into it, you can say, this is getting too easy for you. I want to challenge you. So this is now going to be 20, 30, 40. It could be, you know, 33, 66, 99, whatever you want. So you can start to raise the economy and have a little bit of inflation and make the child work harder to get their prizes as well in small increments. Okay, oops. So let's see. So now we have, you created the bucks. We now have the prize options. And then a couple of notes about this. Uh, from feedback from families, uh, schedule, make a rule that cashing in prizes always happens on a weekend. Because I have had clients who they reach their prize threshold on you know, a Wednesday night or something, 
And then, you know, at 7.45, they said, okay, we got to go for ice cream. And you know, you're, you're putting kids to bed, it's too close to bedtime. So again, proactively set the expectation that we are not going to, um, we're not going to do, do prizes until the weekend, all right? And that way you have leeway, you know, we're going to, are we going to do it Saturday or are we going to do it Sunday? So you can, you can schedule it better if you uh, can do it on a weekend. So this is sort of a fun way to do it. Um, for older kids, they might respond actually to money. If, you, if that, those are your family values. So a child's um, allowance could be tied into yeah, chores, but it also could be tied into coping and successful coping or successful so, uh, social socialization. So you can think about that as a motivator for the older child. So this still works even for older kids. You just have to make it less cute and modify it. Okay. I'm gonna make a, a quick pit stop here and see. We went to this in depth in part one, which is in the other video. And so compassionate social coaching and problem solving is the C in the arch. So, so far we talked about anticipating with teaching social skills and creating positive expectations. The reinforce is the TPR, and now we added a reward system tonight in this presentation. And now we have social coaching in question form. We, we nicknamed it Jeopardy Social Coaching because everything happens in question form in Jeopardy. Why? Why, so, why in question form? Because we give the child the gift of doing the social thought. We want your child to process the situation and then select the best possible behavior. And it's like a muscle. So each time you have your child do the thinking, it's like weightlifting, right? Child's getting stronger at doing this type of thinking. So let's say you just gave instructions. You know, you might say, um, at, but your child's not listening or they're off task. You can ask, Johnny, what are you, what are you supposed to be doing right now? Uh, oh, where does your body need to be right now? If, they, if your child has, wand, child has wandered away from wherever they're supposed to be. Wait a minute, who's giving instructions right now? They go, you are. That's right, good thinking. All right, listen to my instructions. So question form for being on task or off task. Notice it's much softer than off, a straight redirection. Get back in your seat versus where does your body need to be right now? You can see the difference. A, a harsh direction, a straight direction of, you know, get back in your seat is a statement that your child can now push back on if they're at all oppositional. But if you say, where does your body need to be right now? Your child starts thinking and they look around and then they might self-correct and they might move back to uh, their seat. Okay, so question form. Next, you can also use uh, Jeopardy social coaching for um, to help kids learn and understand socialization and, and um, perspective taking, theory of mind. So you can say, let's say that your child has just hurt or offended someone's feelings. Okay, you can say, take a look at her face. Uh, think about Emily's feelings right now. What can you do to keep her comfy around you? Uh, back on that original poster with the action reaction, the golden line, what will people think about you if you do blah, blah, blah? What would be a great behavior to make kids think, make kids think great things about you? What would be a great behavior to put in that golden line? So question form gets your kids to do the social cognition. And again, you are now powering your child up to, um, to practice and practice their socialization. Next for social coaching, a lot of things that um, kids struggle with boil down to problem solving in real time. And that's when kids get frustrated or they conflict with peers. So this is a simple problem solvers worksheet that walks kids through a sequence and uh, that helps them at the sequence of problem solving. So first identifying what is the problem? What's the challenge here? How did it make you feel? And that's just for emotional learning. Number three, list two to three things you could do to try to solve it. Let's generate options. One of the keys to all problem solving. Let's have options. Because number four is, okay, now pick one that you think might work and try it. Which one do you think has the best chance of working? And then number five is, if it doesn't work, go back to number four, and what's, what's plan B? What are you going to do instead? So we're helping kids to see that options are good, and that 
uh, it's not always the first option that works. Sometimes you have to go to a second option. You don't have to melt down. This is a natural part of life. So hopefully your child will be willing to engage in this. But uh, I know that a number of kids, perhaps your child, might resist. So we want to activate their engagement. Okay, so if your child is resisting, oh, I don't want to talk about that. It's too frustrating. It's too hard, right? Um, the top bullet point says, well, let's see if you give your child some control here and say, okay, we have to do this. We have to talk this over. But when is a better time for you? Now we can do it now or we can do it after dinner. I mean, when do you choose? It has to be today sometime if possible. So that way your child can't wriggle out of it and just try to like not, not go over that challenge and not learn from it. Um, so that's the first option is let's see if we can, you know, give you a little control when, 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 would we, when would work for you. Sometimes if the child has choice, they're more willing to do it than if they feel cornered. Uh, but then if a child continues to resist, then we can go, okay, time out. We cannot go on with your day. I see you're trying not to talk about this, but we really need to. So we're not gonna do anything else, you know, no work, no screen, no screen time, no iPad time, no video games. You can't have your phone right now. You know, we, we, we can't go on with your day until you problem solve this with me, until we talk about this, okay? So that's one way to, to press pause. We sometimes we call it a forced problem solving break, a boredom break, and kids are like, they think they're gonna wait you out, but then they get impatient because they're bored not being able to do whatever they're gonna do. So, uh, but you have to let them know that you're going to do this. This is now uh, a strategy. All right, so now we've gone over the A, the R and the C. Tonight, the next part is all of the original stuff that I wanna share with you tonight that is most uh, impactful. And this is, what about those behaviors that are really completely unacceptable or disruptive? or total refusal to participate in social coaching. These are the hardest things for any family or to deal with and, or teacher. And so we wanna talk about the H, creating a holding environment using limits and boundaries. We already talked about the reward system to motivate kids to engage, but what about some deal breaker behaviors, things that are not okay? We're gonna talk about natural and logical consequences, okay? And so a therapeutic holding environment is like swaddling a baby. So the holding, babies feel held tight, right? When we swaddle them. Why do we swaddle them? We swaddle babies because their, their neurology is so raw, it's not quite developed yet, it's not finished cooking. And so when they are not hugged tight, uh, held tight, their limbs are kind of spastic and they feel a little out of control, like they feel like they're falling and they could be more irritable, more, they might cry more. And so they get much more peaceful when they're wrapped tight. They feel safe. Now, we are not going to wrap the older kids up, um, but the way that we do that is with rules, expectations, and limits and consequences. And so a holding environment is like a bird's nest. It, hold, it keeps the birds in the nest so they don't fall out of the nest, right? Holding environment, hold your child firmly so that there's less wiggle room for a lot of uh, extraneous behaviors, things that are not helpful or necessary. Also for the child who's anxious, knowing what to expect creates order and predictability. And your child needs consequences to be predictable to learn from them. If they feel haphazard, your child's going to be, say that's not fair, I don't get it, you're just being mean, this seems arbitrary, right? So we wanna um, decrease anxiety and decrease impulsiveness so compare the above the top picture, organized, they're all sort of loose doing their own thing. And now when we put things in order, they're organized, they're all together and marching in step. All right, there's our love and limits sign, right? So a reminder, up until now, we've been talking about increased behaviors, the TPR and rewards. Now we're gonna talk about decreased behaviors and we want to, um, use limits, consequences, and predictability. So now behavior, what is it? Behavior is also your child's communication. So you can see that the basis for all motivation sort of can be boiled down to three things. 
your child either wants to increase comfort and pleasure, like the bottom left picture. They might want to decrease discomfort or pain. This guy's running from a bear, right? I'm going to avoid that thing that's going to be uncomfortable or cause me tension or pain. And the third thing is power and control, which is interesting because power and control could actually fall into number one or number two. When I feel in control, sometimes I feel that's pleasurable. I feel, I feel comfort. And also I can decrease my discomfort and anxiety when I'm in control. So when kids are really oppositional, that's what they're going for, power and control. So why do I mention these motivations to increase comfort, decrease discomfort? Because behavior has wisdom and we wanna learn from your child. So yes, we're gonna talk about behaviors and consequences, but we also need to stop and think, what is this behavior telling me, okay? Are there any patterns? Oh, my child often melts down at this time or in this class or with this task. So what's hard about that task or that environment? So we know, then we can start to provide empathy. Oh, this is hard for you. Behavior is communication and if we can give empathy and then start to problem solve, we can help them. If we react just punitively with consequences, then uh, your child's not learning from it necessarily. And it just feels like it's reactive. Child reacts and then adult reacts in, in, in relation. So behavior is communication, which boils down to what does my child need? Let's go beneath the iceberg, figure out what does my child need? And in short, Kids need three things. Once they start acting out, whether it's a social miscue or whether it's an emotional reaction or something impulsive, there's, the communication is they either need skills to better cope with that moment, with that task or that demand, or perhaps they need the environment to be structured differently. So that's the second consideration for you. And then third, your child might have just needed to proactively know what to expect. And so what are the limits and boundaries in this situation? So we're gonna talk about that. Okay, one quick note, not all behavior is behavior. Uh, if you ever attended my talk on frustration and anger, this will be a familiar poster, but what this basically comments on is there are four, I, we d demonstrate four levels of frustration, the bottom level, is the red phase and it is anger, it is meltdowns. And we don't consider that behavior because your child has lost control. So anything that happens in a tantrum is not really what we're talking about in this presentation. But the other three levels of frustration, everything up to before a, a tantrum can be considered behavior and that can be shapeable, okay? With the TPR and the rewards and with the consequences we're gonna talk about. Right, So guess what? Just like with the positive behaviors, the increased behaviors, we're also going to WPP, the decreased behavior list. We're gonna write, publish, and post the things that we want the kids to not do, only this time it looks different. If you're writing it down, first you say you started with the word no, no talking back. But then you always have to tack on, what is the replacement behavior you like to see your child do? Instead, if you just say stop talking back, your child doesn't have anything else to do instead, okay? So we want uh, to uh, first give the no rule, no talking back, no hitting or kicking, but then do walk away and take a break. What do you wanna see your child do instead? So one half could be a consequence for, no, for hitting or kicking. You need a timeout, maybe you lose something, right? But then also, there's a reward. So there's a negative positive swing. If, if you walk away and take a break, I'm going to notice it, TPR it, and you might even get a token, right? So now there's a swing to help your child really think through better. Hmm, what's my road to happiness here? What's going to help me succeed, right? So no insults or hurtful speech. Consider others' feelings instead. You can you get the pattern. And here, camp rules, no interrupting. And then positive, wait your turn to talk. With Zoom, mute your microphone until it's time. Right? So we're continuing to talk about decreased behaviors. And let's see. So to give love or limits, when do we say yes? 
yes is like the default setting and we want you to give tpr and in the yellow green and uh, orange phases you're like that's when you're giving tpr great job doing this i see you doing that that was really helpful awesome at that um and you're going to continue to say yes and give tpr if a behavior is not bothering anyone we're going to do targeted ignoring and that's when you do all your tpr but then here's when your nose kick in you want to pick your battles but you want to save your nose for health and safety is a top thing freeze right stop uh -uh, not okay you can have that that clarity of voice and that'll often freeze a child in their tracks if they're about to do something dangerous or hurt someone right freeze stop right and they'll, they'll often catch themselves they look and you might be able to head them off at the pass. So that's a time definitely to say no, to intervene. If whatever they're doing is agitating the family um, or creating um, unsafe situations, running far ahead, running towards the street. Um, if you're in a classroom situation, if they are sitting far away from the group without permission, and then that might cause other kids to start to leak away from the group, right? So these types of things. So loosening the social order right, this becomes disruptive. So if it's disruptive, you need to comment on it probably, okay? You can't let that one go. If they're misusing properly, property, using it destructively, breaking things, mistreating people, I say misusing, mistreating people, right? Those are the times to set limits. But if there's something that's not disruptive and it's not harming anyone, let that go for now, you have bigger fish to fry. Don't forget, we're still working on action reaction the social cause and effect. And so now we're going to get into the if then of behavior. What we're talking about to kids is if you do X, then Y happens. You choose to have a consequence when you do X. And so you can do this on paper, invite the outcome you want. You can have a paper with two sides, positive outcome, rewards, fun, negative outcome. Um, you need a break. You um, maybe you lose your iPhone. Okay, it's a negative outcome, positive negative outcome, and then you can go above that with the kids on this compare and contrast paper and say, what would you choose? Would you choose a negative outcome or positive outcome? Kids always say positive outcome. Well, okay, what do you have to do to get the positive outcome? All right. Now, lastly. If you're going to do if-then consequences, if we're going to teach if-then, consequences need to be predictable. If you're being reactive with a consequence, your child's going to feel like, oh, like that was unexpected, and, and you're just being mean. You're being capricious. So um, predictable should be written down and only given when they've been announced and published. Now, your child might do some new and creative behavior and that you don't have a rule for you cannot give a consequence really for that behavior if you didn't name it and WPP it. If it's not written down, officially, it's like you're changing the rules of the game. How can you punish me? I didn't even know, right? So, and for the child who is neurodiverse, who has social, emotional, cognitive challenges, they truly might not have known. So what is a consequence? A consequence is that firm thing, it's the brick wall, and then your child needs to have the experience of possibly coming into contact with the brick wall, hopefully not literally, literally with their head, but they receive this immovable, they bump into this immovable action and they go, oh, my head, I don't know if I wanna do that again. So we want this to become a teaching and learning process. This is not a control and containment, you know, behave, come on, do as you're told. We want your child to learn to think through social situations and make better choices. We want your child to learn new coping, all right? So as I said, let's be proactive with it. You're gonna WPP, write down your negative list. Don't do this, don't do that, right? And then you also wanna write, make your consequences predictable. What might happen if you do X, Y, or Z? Write that down because we want your child to know what's coming. You know, here's the consequence, don't bump into this. And then your child still might, your child might need to bump into and, and receive your consequence one time, two times, three times. And then they go, oh, 
that stinks. I don't want that to happen anymore. So if your child gets a consequence, that's the point of it. Um, don't think that anything's failing if your child gets the consequence a number of times because that's a part of the learning process. They might have to get it five times before they start to decide, hmm, that's not good for me. I'm going to choose a different route. I'm going to take my road to happiness. Right. So what is a consequence? It's like bang head here. But when you stop, it's going to feel so good. I love this image. So there are a few types of consequences that are the most effective. Okay, so one, we're going to talk about natural consequences. So this is a natural consequence is when life happens and it just doesn't work out. And it's important for you not to rescue the child. So for instance, let's say your child blurted out something to a friend uh, at school, like, uh, I'm not going to be friends with you anymore. Okay, the next day that child doesn't sit with your, your child. Okay, they don't want to sit near your child. They feel like they were just like yelled at. Your child ended the friendship. So then your child goes home, you find out what happened. And so don't like poor baby your child or say, oh, that your the peer is so mean. You can say, well, action, reaction. How do you think that worked out? Did you, you know, would you want that to happen again? No, you know, was that working for you? No, so instead the next time you're frustrated, instead of saying, we're not friends anymore. What could you do the next time to make sure that you stay friends and you keep that friend? And then you problem solve, you can, you can script it out. What would you say? Uh, you can say like, um, I don't like when you said that, or, um, or that hurt my feelings. So whatever it is that you, you and your child brainstorm, that's what they can use, right? But first they have to feel the pain of their social miscue and then they evaluate. Again, question form. How do you think that worked out for you? What can you do differently next time? So that's a, a natural consequence when just life happens and your child has to evaluate if that worked or did not work for them. The second type are logical consequences, okay? So this is when the, the simple formula is you want to separate the child from the direct object that's being misused or the person being mistreated. So if you're mean to your sister, you need a break, separate. Uh, let's say you're teaching your child responsibility and you expect your child to put their scooter back in the garage or shed, if you have one. Uh, and your child leaves the, the it keeps leaving the, the scooter out and is not learning the responsibility that you want your child to learn. Then you can say, okay, um, anytime you remember, there could be TPR, could be a reward for that. But also, if you don't, you lose it. You will lose uh, the scooter the next day if you're not being responsible with it. Creating more motivation for the child to make that decision. Mm, I'm gonna think a little harder. I wanna keep my scooter, I love my scooter. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, the phone. If they're using it sneakily, if they are posting inappropriate things, you can have a, a proactive rule about that and say you are going to lose your phone for a day for a common mistake. But if you're sneaky with it, if you're lying or doing something that's really deceitful, then you can lose it for a whole week. So you can do that. So separate the child from the object being um, used not responsibly, but also it's really effective to set a duration for the loss and even give them criteria for how they can earn it back. So let's say your child uh, loses uh, screen time because they didn't, you know, it's a weekend day. You wanted your child to get off their device at 10 o'clock in the morning, your child didn't. So they lose it for the day. But then um, perhaps if you give them an opportunity to earn it back at four o'clock, you know, you can say, if you make great choices all day and you're really thinking about your behavior and being kind, then you actually can earn it back at four today or at six or whatever time you prescribe. And so then you're actually motivating the child to select better behaviors and think a little harder about their behavior during the duration of the loss to earn it back. So set a duration for the loss and an opportunity to earn it back as well. Another strategy you can use if you're going to use this to help to shape behavior. Okay. All right. Um, if then, if you are unkind to someone, then you might need to uh, perform a gesture to make amends. What could you do to make your friend feel better, you know, after that big fight? 
If you make a mess or break something, then after you calm down, you'll need to fix it. Right? So if there's a tantrum on the back end, child calms down, they might have to be a part of the repairs. Either you can have them work it off and have some chores to have some responsibility, or you could have them, if it requires a contractor, they need to sit with the contractor and watch how the contractor repairs that object that they broke. So if then, right, logical consequences. If you, if you break something, repair. If you make a mess, clean it up. Um, okay. And so out of the ashes of a mess up, of receiving a consequence, that's when your child soars. That's when your child can learn and practice their new behaviors. Ultimately, ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to empower your child to make choices to take their road to success, the road to happiness, okay? And now we have some deal breaker behaviors, all right? These could be dangerous or destructive. They could be bullying or threatening. It could be a complete refusal, just oppositional behavior uh, when you try to do social coaching with them or to participate in school. So these are kids who are over controlling. You may call them oppositional defiant disorder, they, that they have that, your child might have that diagnosis. Um, I don't care, they flip the I don't care switch. Okay, you might know a child like that and very difficult to deal with, very powerful in a family. And so here's the last strategy. This is the strongest response for the most uh, dire of behaviors. So there's a strategy called the family plan versus the kid plan. And this is for the child who is so powerful, we want to both take back control for the parents and have you be back as the executives of the family business, so to speak. But also the child is, you know, the wisdom of the behavior, the child is clamoring for control. I need to control everything. I need to say no, 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 right? So we want to say, all right, uh, we're going to really emphasize the child's agency, the child's choice, but here's the way it works. So we're going to make a compare and contrast. We're going to say, okay, well, um, Johnny, there are two plans here. There's the Johnny plan. The Johnny plan is when you do whatever you want and you don't really want to work on homework and you won't even, you, you won't work with, you won't work with the therapist and you're not even uh, trying to talk to us about how to solve these problems. That's the Johnny plan, right? But the family plan, the Fogel family plan is we have all these fun things. We have yours, the iPhone, we have the iPad, we've got video games, right? We have all the games. We have all these privileges that you have that are so fun, but that's the family plan. That's not the Johnny plan. When kids are on the family plan, they get all these privileges, but there's nothing that says in the bill of rights that you are entitled to an iPhone or an iPad. So here's what's gonna happen. If you are on the Johnny plan, okay, then you're not on the family plan. The Johnny plan, you're a kid. You don't have, you don't pay for the iPhone or the accounts or anything, right? So um, uh, if you're on the Johnny plan, you are choosing to ground yourself. You don't have any privileges on the Johnny plan. But if you decide, if you decide to get on the family plan, then you keep all your privileges. So you're choosing to ground yourself. Okay. If you choose not to cooperate, or if you choose to be mean to your sister, you also choose not to have these privileges. So from now on, if you choose the family plan, then you keep all your fun privileges and you can list them. But if you choose the Johnny plan, you're choosing to be grounded and you lose those things. And you might have to physically take them away. You might have to take away remote controls to TVs temporarily, right? It's, but it's really important in some of these critical things if your child's refusing to go even to therapy or to participate. So this is just that really uh, urgent thing, both taking back control while also um, giving the child the illusion or the actual choice that they can select their outcome. Total grounding if you just are on the Johnny plan. So if your child basically does homework and starts to show up for therapy, that sort of a thing, okay. Great, um, and they keep, they keep all their privileges. Okay, so, and then when they have their privileges, they're also earning chips. This child is most likely going to need a reward system. 
Okay, so you want to have a lot of positive reinforcement and encouragement to be on the family plan as well. So there's something in it for him and there's something to avoid that negative positive swing. All right, and that takes us to the end. So we're talking about shaping behavior tonight. We talked about increased behaviors and decreased behaviors. And we talked about if then and balancing love with limits. Right, and then we talked about making consequences predictable, writing them down, and then having these actionable consequences that are really logical and they're already written down so your child knows that they're coming and that will empower your child to take the road to happiness, okay? You can read up more on these uh, techniques in my book that I mentioned earlier, and this is the program. So I noticed that for some reason, I talked long tonight, it's already uh, been an hour and a half, I can stay longer and answer any questions. Thank you for the kind words in the chat. I appreciate that. And so if uh, oops, someone's signing on right now. So if uh, you have any questions and you still have time, you'd like to stay on, I'm able to stay on a little, little longer. You can also email me any questions that you have. Tomorrow, you will receive an email that has a recording of the book, sorry, a recording of this presentation. And um, it also will have some attachments of things that are resources for you, including the PowerPoint that I shared tonight, okay? And I see I'm correct that we've, we've been at it for uh, one hour and we still have another 15 minutes for a Q&A, so we're right on time. Okay, so uh, let's see, I see there are some chats that came in. You can also feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, let's see. There's one question that came in. How to tailor a family plan versus kid plan when a child is adopted and has permanency attachment issues that are deep-seated? Drawing a line between uh, a parents and adoptee feels very risky. A for adopted, a adoptive parents. Oh, well, adoptive parents, thank you. Uh, feels very risky. Uh, that is, we constantly remind the child that he or she's part of the family. Um, and it feels destructive to create a narrative that she is an outsider, the Johnny plan. So again, so you need to know your child. And if any of these consequences would be destructive, then you, you must stay away from them. So that makes sense. That being said, if someone is being so powerful uh, to the point that they are shutting down all other efforts, uh, they're already acting out uh, their attachment issues as well. They're, they're pushing away, they're controlling. And so doing something in the present won't necessarily isn't the harmful thing. That child already has wounds because of their, uh, when they were given up for adoption and that, that loss, that's early prim primary separation. So I would say that um, you could actually try it. But again, when you institute this, it's not done reactively. You're actually teaching the child in advance what's coming. So this is not about not loving you, not being a part of the family. Simply, literally, this is about, you know, are you participating in the family's life, which includes homework, therapy, if your child needs therapy, um, conversations, problem solving conversations. And so this actually is more inviting you to be in the family, right? But you do have a choice in terms of the consequences, okay? It's not that you're in or out of the family, it's that you're choosing to be grounded if you're on your own plan, if you're doing your own thing that has nothing to do with the family's you know, values or, or goals. Hope that made sense the way I parsed it. Um, but so again, thank you. yeah, I'm, but if you really just don't think that it's the right thing, then in your heart of hearts, then, then stay away from that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, great. Let's see, any other questions? You can chat them or you can unmute yourself. Okay, question came in. Can you speak a little more about consequences for tantrum behavior or behavior that's beyond the child's control? Our child has pans, okay. 
is pans pandas you can type yes or no yes okay um all right so i'm going to go back to that slide to answer your question we're going to back it up a little bit so pans pandas is and actually an illness for anyone who doesn't know. And there could be a child who was otherwise developing healthy in the healthy um, arc, developmental arc, and then they have an illness like strep, streptococcus, and then um, it invades their system and then they start to behave differently and they can behave uh, with emotional dysregulation, um, tantrums, they can, appear to have ADHD symptoms sometimes, or they can appear to have um, autism type behaviors. And so just for anyone who doesn't know, because that, that's not as well of a known diagnosis, but so, um, but this also applies for, you know, people who are kids who are on the spectrum. Um, in their functioning, in everyone's functioning, we have three levels of the brain. And so, from the bottom up, our brains grow in from the bottom up. The bottom part is here, is underneath, and this is the brain stem. And that is the wrist of the brain stem. The middle part is sort of like the mammalian brain, like monkeys, dogs, like it's the social part of the brain where the feelings lie. And then on top, the third part is our human thinking brain, okay? Um, so when someone is dysregulated, they're thinking from the bottom up. So that their brilliant human brain gets hijacked. So that's not here. Even the social part of the brain is kind of turned off and all what they're left with is that very primal part of the brain, which is the fight, flight, freeze part. We call that in our therapy for young kids, we call that the dinosaur brain, the dino brain. Okay, it's the limbic system, fight, flight, and freeze. And that part of the brain is, has no rational thinking. And in fact, it even loses a lot of its language processing. So um, behaviors that happen then, you should not be intervening with tantrum behaviors. Our message is, if I can step out of the way, um, your only choice is to calm down. The, your only job right now is to calm down. That's it. You know, and I'll be here. So your job is just to keep things safe, keep things from being destroyed if you need to. So um, I recommend uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, Mike Fogel's Art of Friendship, uh, there are some videos about how to handle tantrums, but um, they go in depth into all of this. And there's a very specific approach where you get that on the child's level. You say, um, I'm here, your only job is to calm down. I'm gonna be right here. And you back off, give a little space. And meltdowns, there's a loss of control and it's a wave, it's called the limbic wave. So the child, it's like a wave on the ocean that rises, it crashes and it falls and then it recedes. And once an actual tantrum or meltdown is underway, there's no amount of talking or lecturing or rewards or consequences that will work. So now on the back end, when the child's all the way calm, then you can do the if then of, okay, we just need to clean it up. You know, we have to make amends. We can, you know, that sort of a thing. So on the back end, when things are calm, that's when you can do those cleaning up, making amends, the if then things. But we don't believe, and in our program, don't believe in punishing someone after a tantrum because the tantrum itself is devastating enough. It's a consequence. So now we're just going to use the natural consequences of cleaning up, the logical consequences. Okay. Um, now, all the behaviors prior to that, when your child still has uh, their, their cognitive wits about them, that's where you can shape behavior with rewards for choosing positive coping, um, using strategies that they learn in therapy if possible. Uh, but I know sometimes with, with um, pans, with pandas, um, the meltdowns come on so quickly, it's almost before they even have a chance to use a coping skill. So that's very difficult. I hope that answered your question in short. And Thank you, form... yes, that was very helpful. Okay, good, good, good. And the longer form answer is in that other video. I suggest that you check it out. Thank you. Yeah. What else? What else? Mm. 
any other questions out in the Zoom sphere? One note on um, impulsiveness. I guess your question also brings something else up for me that I, I can share until other questions come in, which is um, for the child who is extremely impulsive for whatever reason, whether they have a diagnosis or not, uh, impulsiveness is one of the top obstacles to a child executing a coping skill or a social, social skill because they're behaving before they can think, right? Act before you think, that's the definition of impulsiveness. So um, um, social lessons, strategies to slow down, strategies to scan oneself. We have a, a social lesson called, how's your engine running? And so it sort of echoes the, the how's your, it echoes the, the road to happiness. I'm gonna pull that up for you. And it has a similar picture, oops, with only with a car on the road to happiness. And we talk about how if you're out of control, if your car's going too fast, it can't make the turn, right? To go take the road to happiness. You can't make that choice. So you need to pump the brakes. Well, how do you know how to pump the brakes? So then we draw up high in the sky above the road to happiness, a satellite that has a scanner on it. And we tell kids that uh, you need to practice. The scanner is like a feelings scanner. Okay, it's a feelings scanner. It's, it's a how's your engine running scanner. So is your engine fast, medium, or slow? And so once we teach that, and we say that you can scan yourself, we wanna help your child get more self-awareness. The more self-awareness, the more they're thinking about behavior, their behaviors, the less impulsive they will be by definition. So the way to scan is you go, okay, from head to toe, Hey, how's my head feeling right now? Is my head kind of fast or slow? Okay, shoulders, fast, medium, slow. How am I feeling? Stomach, waist, all right. Okay, no, I'm fast, I'm fast. I'm too fast right now. So what are behaviors, actions you can do to slow yourself down? Well, you could take some deep breaths. <sighs> the child perhaps could take a walk. Perhaps the child could, you know, chew some gum actually sometimes. Get a drink of water. Um, do something soothing like draw or sometimes kids need to take a break and actually get out that energy so perhaps they need to jump on a trampoline or they can do wall push-ups you know if they do wall push-ups squats if you can get a child to do squats that engages the largest muscle groups in the whole body the glutes and the thighs and if they do 10 squats sometimes that can help them to discharge some energy and slow down their their engine so a lot of work, if, if we identify that one of the key uh, obstacles to the child's social success is the impulsiveness piece, then you wanna try any kind of skill, self-awareness building and you know, brake pumping type um, strategies. That being said, if none of those work, it's very possible that um, that brain wiring in the frontal lobe uh, is not quite there yet, hasn't developed, and perhaps that child could use some medication um, to, decrease uh, to decrease impulsiveness as well. Um, if that part of the brain can be regulated better and get have those connections be made, uh, a lot of times the impulsiveness calms if the medicine is, is um, effective. And then all of a sudden you'll see that child be able to execute socially and then they can use their learned social skills and coping skills. Let's see, any other new questions? The one more minute. All right, well, how to handle a child who thinks they are in control as if they are the parent, disrespectful towards adults and parents, always compares themselves to either older sibling or significant other. Yes. Um, some kids, for various reasons, whether emotional or because of um, or their social awareness, their social cognition, 
they don't really differentiate between um, themselves as a youngster versus someone who is older. And there's actually a hierarchy. And so sometimes a child um, A might have a strong need for control, you know, period, you know, full stop. And sometimes there's confusion about that. So sometimes it's helpful if you if you take out a piece of paper and you go on Google, on Wikipedia, and you find out like what is the hierarchy in the military or in a police force? You know, there's you know, cap, sergeant, captain, private, you know, whatever. I, I don't know all the, the hierarchy myself. But if you write that down and you can show that who are the people that are in charge? The people that are in charge are the people that have usually more experience or more uh, education, you know, uh, in that field. Um, they can compare it to school. There's principal, vice principal, teachers, students. So who's in charge and who has to do the listening, right? And so if you just kind of show this, you guys could do this on paper or around the table and you can show everyone, just get a family conversation around that. And then, you, and then the third column you make is family, you know, grownups, you know, parents, caregivers, and then kids. And all the kids are at the same level. A, a, a sibling shouldn't really have um, responsibility over another sibling. That causes a lot of problems in and of itself. Um, so sometimes drawing this out and having a whole extended conversation about hierarchy and what direction do things go? Instructions, right? And directions go downhill, right? The higher people in the hierarchy, the directors, they're the ones who give instructions down. Now it's not only one direction. The people who are in the lower standing in the hierarchy, like let's say in a school, the kids, they can, you know, give information, they can say if they like something or don't like something, they can say that. Um, but ultimately, they aren't in charge. What would happen if there were a fire and the kids were in charge, right? Um, kids need the caregivers. And so this is a, a whole line of conversation that I would probably have with that child. Um, and once you kind of do that to get the social expectations right, then you can say you can make a reward system. You can do one of our buck systems and say a do rule do follow grown-ups rules, right? Where you can have like a no, no talking back, right, is a no. And then the positive formulation, uh, the replacement behavior would be, so no talking back, you can say, um, okay, or I hear you. And then that could be a reward. So then you give TPR, yes, great listening. I love the way you said, I hear you, bucks for you. So then you can reinforce the positive behavior on that if you want to shape that. So I hope that helps. Um, thanks for that question. And we are out of time. So we are going to wrap up for tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure. I love sharing this material. Thank you for being with me. And uh, I hope to see you again at a future presentation. So take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night.